A warm welcome to the Evolution Show. I'm Johan Landgren. I hope you're great. I'm really glad to be back after a longer break working on the final design of my energy house with my brilliant father. The whole house is designed to save energy and work partly off-grid. It will have a masonry oven connected to the floor heating, as well as a huge rainwater tank for rainwater harvesting, and a lot of solar panels, of course, and much more. I plan to share my experience once the construction begins later this year, which I hope can be helpful and inspiring to others. But today I hope you join me for a vital conversation about what I call the perfect energy storm. The peak and decline in world natural gas and oil production. With today's guest, Arthur Berman, the amazing geologist and one of North America's leading experts on oil and natural gas. The perfect energy storm is unlike anything humanity has faced the last 200 years. And according to Berman, it may hit the world economy already over the next couple of years. My talk with Art Berman is longer than usual, so check out the chapter sections below to jump straight into the pond. And be sure to look out for part 2 next week, where Art Berman explains why the world oil production may start to decline over the next couple of years, and why this means adapting to a totally new reality. I hope you appreciate the conversation as much as I did, and if you do, feel free to give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to support the show. Ok, let's get going. This is the Evolution Show. Welcome back to the Evolution Show, Arthur Berman. Glad to be here, Johan. It's a pleasure to see you again. Yeah. You are with us today from Houston in Texas, and uh, I hope you could navigate us through what I call the perfect energy storm. Why electricity prices, cheap natural gas and the oil world we have become so dependent on may be about to change dramatically. And you will show how this is connected to an imminent peak in the US shale boom, and why renewables won't be enough to maintain a growing world economy at least not as we are accustomed to, why we need to adapt to a smaller world using less energy. But before we get started into this very important discussion, for people who don't know anything about you, could you please tell us a little bit about you and your background? Well, of course. So I'm a, I'm a geologist, an earth scientist. I've been doing energy work for 45 years, more or less. Um, I worked about, uh, well, the first 20 years I worked in the oil and gas business. And since then, I've, I've been an independent consultant. And while I still do um, oil and gas uh, consulting, uh, I, I no longer do any kind of uh, uh, exploration or production work. It's mainly uh, how to understand uh, supply, demand, uh, uh, quality, and how that fits in with the bigger picture of energy in general and the economy and uh, climate and the ecology, human behavior, all of these very lofty and, and complex things. But so I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm very much interested in the, the, the big picture, uh, the broad uh, sort of planetary view of what we want to do uh, and what is possible or feasible. And as, as you began uh, your, your excellent introduction, uh, if we say we want something, then what might be the consequences for the way that we live our lives? So that's, that's a little bit about me. Yeah. And uh, actually, I have to mention that uh, when I wrote my book, uh, it's like peak oil for dummies for a Swedish market, a Swedish book. Uh, one of the chapter was about the shale boom and uh, you were one of the primary sources actually. Uh, I learned a lot from you back 10 years ago basically when I started to, to write the book. Um, and um, so yeah, you've been a huge inspiration for me. And uh, yeah, 
And uh, so I thought we could start, as you said, about the bigger picture. Uh, people following this channel, they are obviously very interested in renewable energy and what we can do about this dilemma, this fundamental uh, change um, and um, dependence we have on fossil fuels today. Uh, we have to be honest, start the, the honest discussion before we can move on uh, to, uh, you know, adapt and do um, find solutions. So let's start about the big picture, talking about the big picture, the world energy consumptions. Can you just guide us through how does it look today? Sure. So the first thing is we talk, a lot of people talk about how we're engaged in some sort of a grand energy transition that we're moving away from fossil fuels and we're moving to some kind of a, a renewable or alternative energy future. And, um, I, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm a hundred percent in favor of that. Uh, however, uh, that's not the way that things work. Uh, it's not the way things have ever worked. And unless today is somehow completely different than the past, um, that's an unrealistic expectation. And so the reality is, is that energy transitions are what I call additive. That means that we never stop using any form of energy or even considerably reduce that form of energy. So for instance, if we go back to biomass, you know, basically uh, wood and uh, burning things and, you know, using animal power and human power, which was the principal uh, form of energy from, you know, 300,000 years ago, really, until the Industrial Revolution. The world doesn't use any less biomass today than it did, let's say, in 1800. It's just that the percentage of biomass is very, very small because, now we use fossil fuels and, and, and lately renewables. Uh, the same is true for coal, that we actually use more coal today than we did in 1800. Um, and even though we, you know, we, ha we think that we're moving away from coal, th that, that's not what the data tells us. In fact, you know, we're, we're using on average about 25% more coal over the last 15 years than we used in the 20 in the 15 years before that that's a you know very disturbing uh piece of information considering that the the best reason for a renewable future is to get off of coal which is the main source of global or the single largest source of emissions so so the other thing then is we we hear daily you know, about how, uh, you know, the growing percent of uh, electric vehicles as a, you know, as a percentage of new car sales and, and, and all the growing capacity of solar and wind. And, and all of that is true. However, when we look at the big picture, all of that renewable energy only accounts for about 5% of the world's total energy consumption today. And, and we can say, oh, well, you know, that's going to change. And, and, and I certainly hope that it will. But, but when we look at history, we, we don't go from 5% to 50% or 100% in a decade or two or three or four. It just never works that way. Um, and as I said before, more likely we will be using just as much or nearly as much biomass, coal, oil, and gas in 30 or 40 years as we are today, we'll just be adding a lot more renewables on top of that. And the percentage of fossil fuels will decrease, but not the absolute amount. And so the earth, the ecosystem that we're trying to save, it doesn't care about percentages. It cares about or doesn't care about anything because it's it's the earth. But I mean, what we should care about are total emissions, not that the percent of coal is going down relative to the to, to the total, because emissions are emissions. And if we're not using any less coal, oil or natural gas or not much less than emissions keep going up. And that is the problem that if we if we look at 
total emissions, carbon dioxide, methane, all of these things, all the greenhouse gases, we've made almost no progress whatsoever since we first recognized that global heating might be a problem 40 or 50 years ago. We've had 35 or 36 international climate conferences in which we always say the same thing. And I'm not being critical, okay? This is the way human beings work. But the truth is, is that global emissions keep climbing. And the reason they keep climbing is that no matter how much renewables we add, if we don't reduce our total amount of energy consumption, it's just not going to make any material difference. And so the message that that I would like people to take away from this conversation, if they remember nothing more, is that the problem isn't fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are a big problem, don't get me wrong. The problem is the size of the human enterprise is just too big. And, and we are crowding out all of the other species on the planet. We're poisoning the planet, not just the atmosphere, which is emissions, but we're, we're poisoning the rivers and the lakes and the oceans and the land. And it's all because of the growth of, of the human enterprise. And that's what we really need to look at. And, and, and so in a way, and, and some people won't like this, climate change is kind of a narrow view of the problem. So back to consumption, um, yeah, 5% of what we consume is wind and solar. And if we add in nuclear, you know, we might get ourselves up to eight or 9%, but it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a relatively small fraction and we're just not making very much progress at reducing emissions. So I think we have to, uh, and I'm glad we started here because we just need to get over this idea that we're on the verge of completely changing everything. I'd like to, I'd like to say we are, but that's not what the data says. And unless something radical changes here in the way human beings adopt new technologies and behaviors, it's unlikely that any of these net zero kind of objectives are realistic in 2040 or 2050 or 2060. No. And this all comes back to the core of this talk that this is the problem we're starting with. And the other second part is that we don't have the time to adapt to this new reality, especially not um, if we have a peak in the shale and the shale oil and gas production. Right. Because whether we like it or not, uh, if we are faced within, which we'll come back to soon, within only a few years uh, of the declining energy uh, supply, which is basically what it's all about. You, you talked about the cake, the big energy cake we have, uh, whether it's uh, oil or renewables, it's growing. The cake is, of consumption is growing, which also means that the, the consumption of fossil fuels has been growing. So as you said, the percentage of renewables might increase, but the overall cake is also growing, which means in absolute terms, we're either consuming the same or more of the fossil fuels. So that's where we're starting. That's the problem. And this, this is what, what makes it so interesting and so important to have this talk. We're going to continue it now, is that what's happening with the shale oil industry? So my first question or kind of to get into this, is it, for, is it fair to say that without this US shale bomb we've seen the last decade, uh, wouldn't we be in a big energy crisis uh, with the declining natural gas and oil production because US has been the leader. Basically, US and, and to a smaller degree, uh, Canada, has, uh, when it comes to oil at least, uh, has been, you know, the, the increased, uh, they have increased the exports of oil uh, and production, I would say, um, uh, in the world. While uh, Saudi Arabia, Russia and most of the other oil, oil producers have been either flat or in decline. So let's start with uh, um, to understand for people to understand how important it is to look at the shale oil boom and what you are actually have looked at lately uh, and you know the development in this sector what's what's uh, raising a big con uh, concern when it comes to energy supply right and so for those of us that are old enough to remember um, about 20 years ago there was a big concern about something that was called peak oil. And, and some people even talked about peak oil and natural gas. 
And the reason for that was that the world had reached a, a, a level of production where we just weren't increasing our supply of oil or natural gas, that basically we would, you know, we would discover new fields, sometimes giant new fields, but because of the life cycle aspect of, of getting these fields uh, developed, a lot of them were offshore and very difficult environments. By the time we actually had first oil, it was averaging like eight years from discovery to first oil. And by the time we started these new discoveries producing, old fields had depleted. So we were, we were getting nowhere. Production, oil and gas production was flat. Um, at that time, renewables were not really very much of a, 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 of a factor. And the population of the planet kept growing. And so any intelligent person, particularly investors, were saying, wow, we have a big problem. You know, <laughs> we need more energy and we're just not able to increase our energy supply, or at least we haven't so far. And so then shale came along. And, and, and by the way, it was made possible mostly by higher energy prices. I mean, that's sort of the way it works, that oil prices got very high in 2006, 7, 8, and you know, they dropped a little bit during the, the global financial crisis in 2008 and 9. But by 2010, 11, oil prices were averaging $90 a barrel and, you know, in the in the money of the day in the U.S. at least. And they stayed at those very high levels until 2014. And so it was that that sustained high price of oil and natural gas that made things like shale and oil sands in Canada possible. Uh, we'd known about them for decades. I mean, this was nothing new. It's not like we woke up one day and said, oh, my gosh, you know, we could produce oil from shale. No, we always knew those things were there. They just weren't commercial. So uh, and and for sure, we 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 optimized some of the technologies to get them out of the ground. But none of that was very new either. I mean, we've been fracking wells since the 1860s in the United States. Um, you know, we use nitroglycerin and much, you know, much. Uh, uh, more primitive methods, but none of these concepts are new. So, so all of the growth in global oil and natural gas and natural gas liquids, which is included in in the way that international energy organizations define oil, all of the growth in the last fifteen years is from mostly, as you said, Johan, U.S. shale, and so without U.S tight oil and shale gas, we would be in the same situation as we were in the early 2000s, only worse, which is to say that oil prices would be, who knows, you know, $120, $150 a barrel. And that would be a huge problem for the global economy and for all of our standards of living. So that's what shale has done for us. And, and what the work that I'm doing suggests is not that that's over, but we're at the beginning of the end of, of that increased supply that kind of saved us uh, 15 years ago. So we're, we're going back to a place in which peak oil fears began 15 years ago. And uh, somebody, an optimist would say, oh, well, yeah, but there's a lot more shale in the world. You know, it's not just in the United States and Canada. And, and so no problem. And, and we can discuss that if you like. But, um, you know, my my uh, professional opinion is that's really not true. Um, there are a few bright spots in the world, mostly in the Middle East, where there is potential for additional uh, oil and gas from shale. But it's, you know, it, it, it's relatively limited opportunity. So that's why shale is so important. Yeah. And if we just for a moment focus on the shale gas um, part of it, uh, you, you have written an article, very interesting. I highly recommend it. Uh, recommend it. It's uh, titled Draining America First, the Beginning of the End of Shale Gas. And uh, you paint a very different picture for the nearby, nearby shale gas production in the U.S., uh, could you take us through uh, your most important findings, findings in this article? Uh, perhaps we could start by, with uh, one of the slides where you show, uh, first of all, um, where all these um, um, the biggest fields are uh, 
in in the U.S. and yeah, take it from there. Right, Johan. So I have a slide that viewers can refer to, um, which shows where all of these shale gas and tight oil plays are in the United States. And um, for right now, we're going to talk mostly about the the shale gas component. And there's another slide in which I show all of these these various fields or plays as they're called in the oil and gas business. And, and so they include things that are pure shale gas, and they also include natural gas, which is associated with oil production, as for instance, it is in the, the Permian Basin and the Bakken and, and some of these other plays. And what it shows is that, you know, for the most part, the supply has been climbing and climbing and climbing. And then very recently, it's flattened out or started to turn over and decline. And and again, you know, I'm not I'm not saying, oh, my gosh, you know, the the sky is falling. It's the end of the world. But but I, I I've looked at the components of this. OK. And and when I look at the the big pieces of supply, which are. Appalachia, the Marcella Shale mostly, which is in the eastern United States. I mean, that that's producing something like, you know, 35 billion cubic feet of natural gas per day. Uh, the Permian Basin is is the other, another big one. The Haynesville Shale is providing most of the gas that the United States is exporting as liquefied natural gas. And so um, all of those plays, except for the the Permian, are declining and have been declining for some time or are flat. And so this is this is publicly available data. There, there's no interpretation that's needed here. Uh, the U.S. Department of Energy, you know, wrote some articles uh, on their website a year ago saying that the Marcellus Shale, this huge 35 billion cubic feet of gas per day field is declining. So, I mean, this is nothing that Art Berman is – you know, trying to shake the world up about this is, you know, for people that that follow this this information, this is this is known, um, but it's not known to the average person, and it doesn't seem to be known to um, government leaders and and policymakers. And so the this there's this so the United States is the world's largest producer and exporter of natural gas today. And the United States is building new export terminals like, you know, like crazy. Europe is building import terminals because Europe lost a lot of its supply from Russia back in 2022 with the Ukraine invasion. And the assumption or the belief is that the United States has sort of an infinite supply, at least you know, for the, the medium term of natural gas to supply the world. And, and, and what the data that I'm showing says is, well, no, that, that's really not true at all, uh, that most of these plays are already in decline and the few that aren't are flattening. And, and furthermore, um, I, I looked at the, you know, the, the, the very close detail, like, okay, so what are the average wells producing for their, their total lifetime? This is something we call estimated ultimate recovery or EUR, if you like. It's, it's, it's very similar to reserves. Reserves also have to meet a, an economic threshold to be, a, um, uh, to be counted, whereas an EUR is just a number. But, but they're, they're, they're very similar. And what I found is that in all of these major sources of gas, including the Permian and the Marcellus and the Haynesville, that the the average well over the last two years or so, its productivity has declined by something like thirty percent. Now, again, that 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 doesn't mean that we all need to, uh, you know, that our hair is on fire and we should, you know, be running around the room, uh, you know, freaking out or anything like that. It just means that the wells are getting worse, and eventually that means that our supply is going to decline. The other misconception that a lot of people have is that these shale plays are somehow different than other plays, and they are in how they're drilled and fracked. Okay, that's very different. But once we've established production, these are fields, just like every other field in the world. In all fields, 
increase supply as they're being developed. They reach a peak and then they decline. I mean, this is just earth physics. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing revolutionary about this. And there's nothing about the earth physics of tight oil or shale gas that's any different. And so people have a hard time, I think, believing that this can possibly be true because somehow shale gas and tight oil are are some you know miracle from god well no they're you know they're 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 gifts from the earth and they obey the same laws of earth physics so if all the increase in oil and natural gas production over the last decade or two has been from shale and the indications are that that supply is going to slowly diminish then we're in trouble i mean we're in trouble for supply as long as we need as much oil and gas as we do today yeah and for people to understand when you see a small decline since the world is um, accustomed to or used to uh, having a growth uh, or maintain production even a few percentage of decline per year um, is, is a, has a huge impact and I can just we can, we, I'm gonna let you answer that but I'm just gonna add also that for people here in Sweden and Europe they might wonder okay how does this relate to us but of course we you know, during the last couple of years since the invasion of Ukraine uh, by Russia uh, we have been really in many countries in like France the Netherlands um, and um, Germany are increasingly are importing and also actually even Finland, our Swedish neighbor here, they have built, as you mentioned, um, LNG, uh, liquefied natural gas terminal, to be able to receive these huge ships uh, coming from the US. And, and also just for people to understand, you're, also, you're, you're freezing down um, the, the gas so you can transport it uh, with huge uh, pressure. And then you come to the terminal and then you heat it up and to be able and transform it back, convert it back basically to, to gas, right? That's to natural gas. That's right, right. And 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 in that process um costs a lot of money. <laughs> you know, it's not free. <laughs> um and then plus the transport across the ocean and 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 you know to build the the regasification terminals. I mean, it all adds up. It increases the price of energy. And that's that's another factor that a lot of people don't don't think about and that is that um all of this technology this you know shale oil and shale gas it's come at a price and so the the average the average well you know is is like 40 or 50 percent more expensive than back before we had this and I'm, I'm not i'm not it's not a it's just an observation it's a fact it's not a you know, it's not a criticism. That's just the way it is. And and some people say, oh, yeah, but, you know, look at, I mean, oil prices, they were very high uh, and gas prices until 2014. And then they dropped and they got very cheap for a while. So, you know, you're wrong. Well, this gets back to your point about how a, a very small percentage of, of supply can make a gigantic difference in price because markets they start to see a lack of growth, not necessarily a decrease in supply. And markets, whoever markets are, they're you and me, I think, Johan, and everybody watching this program, this channel, but markets desperately want to maintain enough supply to keep the economy growing. And so a very small decrease in overall energy supply or a flattening is enough for markets to raise the price as far as it needs to go to motivate whoever produces that energy, whether it's oil, gas, wind, solar, whatever, to get busy and, and, and make more. And and yeah. so, or, uh, yeah. go ahead, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then to see, as we've seen in Sweden, I mean, Sweden has been like self uh, in the energy independent for, for a long time when it comes to uh, he heating and electricity for the households and industry, uh, but not for transport sector we importing our, our oil and so on. But we have, what we've seen increasingly the last couple of years, since Sweden is more and more connected to the European energy system, since uh, in, down in Europe, in the central part of Europe, they are using natural gas for heating and electricity. While in Sweden we use uh, nuclear and hydro prim primarily and about 10% wind and some others but uh, so what we've seen lately is what when the supply is even remotely close to you know insufficient due to the 
decreased import from of natural gas. So, uh, if we hadn't had U.S. imports with LNG, we would be in a, a supply. Um, uh, we have, would, would have insufficient supply of energy. So we were already basically, you know, close to that thres threshold in, in Europe. So to, to then, you know, remove uh, the LNG or decrease the LNG imports for Europe, that would be had a, have, have a huge impact to, for, for prices and, and so on. That's correct. So these are, uh, so the world, as you said, is, is increasingly connected and something that happens with a, a uh, shale gas field in you know somewhere in the United States, and people in Sweden may not even know where Louisiana or Pennsylvania is on a map, and that's fine. They there's no reason for them to know, but very quickly the effect of that uh, uh, moves through the entire global economy, and suddenly you're paying you know several. Uh, you know, euros or krona or whatever, you know, per liter of gasoline more or similarly more for natural gas to heat your home or, you know, whatever you whatever you use it for. So um, it, it's all connected and and, and econo economics works on the basis of of the principle of scarcity and the, the cost of of the marginal unit to replace uh, what's being used. And there's so much talk in the world about demand, particularly when we're, you know, when we're discussing oil, it seems like, um, you know, the International Energy Agency and some others, OPEC, they're, they're, they're obsessed with demand, you know, peak demand and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I, I hate to tell them, but, um, you know, markets are concerned with demand, too, but markets are much more concerned with supply because they can't control demand, but markets believe that they can control supply by changing the price. And so they will change, markets will adjust upward the marginal price of a barrel of oil or a, you know, a ton of, of natural gas until producers start making enough of it that they can decrease the price again. So uh, this is the, the these are the mechanics, the dynamics of the way markets work. And a lot of people don't understand that, nor should they. But when it affects them, when they start having to spend more money for energy, then they, they say, what happened? And by the way, when they go to the supermarket to buy meat or fish or grain or whatever, and those prices are higher, they're usually higher because energy prices are higher. We complain a lot about inflation in the world, and you know, all of us want to blame our our, our own government's policies for that. But the truth is, is that global inflation correlates almost perfectly oil price so you can't run away from from energy as much as you would like to uh you know you you want to think oh i i live in a very small village you know somewhere in sweden and and what happens around the world doesn't affect me and and the truth is is that unfortunately it does yeah and i think it's swedish the swedish uh um, people uh, has really increasingly become aware of that since uh, the last couple of years. I think we've lived in a bubble that we had very, very low um, electricity and energy prices here in Sweden, but uh, with what's happening in the world and uh, since we have been connected to the rest of the European Union in terms of delivering uh, energy to the continent, We've also had imported the same prices, uh, at least in the southern part of Sweden. Right. But uh, very interesting. But uh, people, obviously, when they hear this, they wonder, OK, but when is this going to happen? When is the decline coming? And when can, what can we expect if the natural gas production in the U.S. peaks? Is it about, can we talk about three, four, five years in the, into the future? What's your, I know it's very important, uh, very hard to make these kind of predictions, but kind of in the worst case scenario, what's what's your expectation? Right, it's 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 almost impossible to make those predictions, and 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 I, let me just um, explain for a moment that even if the quality, the performance of individual wells is declining, uh, money makes everything work better. If we just drill more wells, even though those wells are poorer, uh, that's going to keep the production up. Okay. So, so the, so 
as an earth scientist, uh, I'm very interested in the geology uh, of the production, but but we can't divorce ourselves from from markets and capital. And so if we have a lot of capital available, we can temporarily, uh, you know, uh, make these supply problems and performance problems seem like they're not a problem. We basically move them into the future. Um, now, unfortunately, one of the effects or the results of the so-called energy transition is that there is increasingly less capital available for the oil and gas business. That a few years ago, back when you wrote your book in 2015, Johan, everybody wanted to invest in oil and gas. Um and you know, and 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 we were in the U.S. We were drilling, you know, so many thousands of wells every every month. And there was, you know, in, a company would, you know, would would make some new shares available in a you know in a, in a secondary offering, and they would raise billions of dollars in a few hours in the morning because everybody wanted to buy the stock um, because they, they saw that there was this need and it was going to grow. That's not the case anymore. Okay. And, and I don't want to, um, you know, take any time discussing why it's just empirically true that, that there's just so much, there's very little outside money available for oil and gas drilling and development that almost all of it has to come from internally generated funds. So that's a, that that's a, a major sea change from a decade ago. And so, whereas in the past, we might've been able to sort of smooth over uh, this decline in, in well productivity with more, more drilling, that's not the way things are today. We just don't have the capital. And even if companies do, uh, they need to satisfy their shareholders and their shareholders don't want them to grow. They want dividends. They want stock buybacks. They want they want to see the stock price go up. And so there's a lot of factors that are conspiring to to not fix this problem. Okay. And and therefore, in answer to your question, I am quite confident that before this decade is over, we're going to see some serious supply concerns by markets for both oil and natural gas. And it would not surprise me if that happened in a year or two, uh, as opposed to, you know, the five or six years that we have remaining in this decade. Um, so I, I can't make a hard prediction, but with the data that I'm seeing, it's just very difficult for me to imagine um, a particularly hopeful scenario. I mean, anything is possible and um, predictions are always wrong. But based on what I'm seeing, I mean, I'm I'm quite confident that that we're going to be looking at much higher energy prices in two, three, certainly four or five years. I it, I, I wish it weren't true. The only way to avoid that is if we have a serious uh, economic contraction, which is equally possible. <laughs> uh, that's not a positive thing, but but that. You know that 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 is the other most likely way that energy prices would stay or or even go lower. It would be a deflationary kind of trend. Yeah, and uh, so when people hear this, they might think like, "Yo, this is great news! Now we can decrease the natural gas production in the world." Uh, of course, this will follow by followed with will be followed by decreased um, carbon emissions, which is all obviously true. Yes, but you you want to you know. Uh, elaborate on this, um, you warn of the consequences for the global economy to even function uh, since renewables cannot replace it in the short term, at least, uh, and into the foreseeable future. So can you explain why it's important to, to be honest and uh, to talk about the consequences and what we need to adapt to uh, when this happens? Well, that's exactly right. And and so there, one of my energy heroes is a uh, um, a Czech fellow who is a Canadian citizen named Vaslav Schmiel. And uh, Schmiel identifies what he calls the four pillars of modern civilization. And those are um, steel, concrete, 
plastic and ammonia, which is the main component in fertilizer. And today, most of the production of all four of those pillars of civilization is hugely reliant on oil and natural gas. And so, for instance, we have a global population that is more than 8 billion today. And the only reason that the planet can support 8 billion people is because of the commercial production of fertilizer, which comes mostly from natural gas. So the population of the world was about 2 billion at the end of World War I, and it was the commercialization of, of fertilizer from natural gas that allowed the world population to grow. And, and you and your, you know, your channel viewers in Sweden will recall, I'm sure, that when the Russian invasion of Ukraine occurred, that all over Europe, fertilizer companies went out of business because the price of natural gas got too high for them to maintain their operations. So something as basic as feeding the world today is almost 100% dependent upon natural gas. And, and, and there are technological optimists of which I am one, and I know you are too, who say, well, that will change. And, and perhaps it will, but that doesn't change the fact that today it hasn't changed. And if we, if we, if we want to avoid mass starvation, especially in the developing world, the global South, we can't afford to have a decrease in natural gas supply, nor can we afford to have natural gas prices increase. Uh, something as fundamental as as steel. Um, I mean, we, we can't we can't make an electric car without steel. We can't make a wind turbine or a solar panel. And 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 what is the main source of energy for steel? It's coal. All right. And somebody in on, you know, on this channel will say, but wait a minute. I mean, we're recycling a lot of steel and and hopefully we can recycle more. And 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 yes, all of that's true, but 70% of our steel production is not recycled. There, there's a shortage of scrap steel in the world. So again, in the future, you know, we hope that will change. But today, that's not the case. So so you can imagine, I won't go into all the the four pillars, but I mean, if if we if we don't have enough steel, concrete, plastic, and 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 fertilizer, then the economy, you know, basically goes down the toilet. And so, and and today, and for the the near future, certainly, those are almost one hundred percent dependent upon natural gas and and oil. So. So this is why, you know, when, when I hear well-meaning, by the way, um, heroic <laughs> activists, you know, especially young people that are, you know, that are, you know, that are pounding the table with their fists saying we have to get off of, of fossil fuels. Well, they're 100% correct, but we can't do it today or tomorrow as, as they, you know, naively think, because if we did then they wouldn't be able to get to their demonstrations, use their cell phones or, or anything else. So somehow or other, you know, we as a society need to understand and figure out how to balance all of these factors and not just hide from what other people like me say, wait a minute, you, you know, if you do that, you're going to wreck everything if you do it too quickly. So, you know, let's, let's take a moment and, and understand what what we must maintain in terms of basic human services. I'm not I'm not in favor of of supporting any industry. Okay, that's not what I'm here to say. I, I'm here to say that you know we can't we can't take some policy decision that causes huge human suffering and death just because we ideologically think it's appropriate. That, that that's that's just not the way the community of humans ought to behave itself. And if people do that out of ignorance, well, you know, I suppose I can forgive them. But <laughs> um, what I do in my work 
is is not to try to change people or convince them of some position. It's to provide those that are interested with the information that they need so that they can make their own decisions in their lives and in their investing that 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 minimizes the kind of of suffering and even death that some of these that bad decisions can result in. And finally, we have talked a lot already and covered many things, uh, but uh, sort of ending, I wouldn't say on a positive note, but uh, ending on what we can do, uh, because we have to obviously adapt to this new reality. It will take time. And uh, the biggest, I think, short term issue is that we don't have so much time. You're presenting us now with the fact that the shale oil production, uh, shale gas production, uh, which has been, you know, the biggest contributor to the energy increase the latest decade, basically, um, is is about to decline. And uh, I, I personally, I think about, I mean, the, for example, when I think about how we heat houses uh, in in most of the world, uh, it, I mean, in Europe, it's natural gas. In US, a lot of it's natural gas or it's coal and so on. But and in Sweden, we're using basically natural uh, nuclear and uh, or primarily, I would say, hydro and then nuclear. Um, but what we can do, I think, which is this is has to do has actually to do with technology, is that if we have solar panels on the roof in a sunny country, for example, the problem in a country like Sweden is that we have a lot of sun for two, three months in, in the summer, <laughs> right. and then we can't run them when we really need them in the, in the winter time. So then we rely on, on other energy sources. But what we can do, and a Swedish guy, an inventor uh, in Sweden has done, is he built a huge house, uh, and he has a lot of sol uh, so uh, solar on, on the roof, but what he's doing is overproducing a lot of sun, uh, generating a lot of uh, electricity from the solar, and he stores it into hydrogen in a, a huge, uh, in a lot of small tanks, um, and then he can use that all year round, actually, uh, during the, the nighttime and during the winter. It's it's an expensive alternative at the moment. It's it's much more expensive than the alternative of just you know introducing a propane tank or something you have in the U.S. But it's a technology that he's saying uh, if you make these tanks bigger, uh, now he's ha have to you know connect a lot of small ones, which is much ex very expensive uh, hydrogen tanks. Uh, the whole system and, and overall system is much more ex expensive, obviously. But uh, with the, this technology, we could at least conserve energy uh, by simply not using so much natural gas, for example, and also using more of the sun. The solar energy now, you know, it comes with the problem that you can't use it overnight and over you can't store it easily i mean batteries are very expensive very complicated and so on you can't just scale that up but with hydrogen and uh, oversupply of sun that could at least be one way to conserve energy uh, as i see going forward what's your uh, take on this yeah i mean so that's a that's a small solution for wealthy people and for people that have the luxury of, of owning their own home. I mean, even in a wealthy country like Sweden, um, an awful lot of the population lives in, you know, in, 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 in flats and in apartment buildings, and, and they don't have that option of putting solar panels on the roof or storing hydrogen in tanks in the, you know, underground or whatever. So uh, m my sense, Johan, is that, Technology, for all of its wonders, um, is uh, takes a long time uh, to penetrate the entire society in an affordable way. And so um, I, I think it's natural and understandable that, that, that as humans, we prefer a fix than, an, than, than actually a solution. Um, you know, well, let, let, let's find some way, mostly through technology, that we can cover up this problem or at least make it seem like it's gone away without addressing the underlying cause. And the underlying cause is that we use far too much energy in our individual lives and in our collective lives as, as, as a human society. And I am not naive, and I don't think there's very much possibility that we're going to change that, although individually, you know, some of us might make those kinds of choices, like the 
you know, the fellow that you you just described. But but collectively, um, you know, we're we're more interested in the you know the football game or uh, you know what what's happening on uh, on television or social media. Most people are not spending a lot of their time, you know worrying about energy supply. So, I mean, this is this is the reality of the situation. So I, I think the best thing for people to do, um, and I'm talking about ordinary people who don't have a, you know, a, don't work in the energy sector, don't have a degree in energy, nor what I expect them to want to. Um, what I think they need to do is to change their, their way of thinking uh, a little bit to change their psychology and say, you know, uh, the way that we've lived in, particularly in the West since the end of World War II, this is a very anomalous period in history, a period of, of really unparalleled prosperity, uh, thanks mostly to the relatively low price and abundance of, of, of natural gas and oil. And that's coming to an end. It's not ending tomorrow. It's not a catastrophe yet. But it's coming to an end, and that means that we all have to adapt. And the first way that we all have to adapt is psychologically. We need to start thinking about things differently. Um, I mean, every time I, I, I think, you know, I, I, I need, I need a new uh, tool um, for, you know, something I'm working on. I'll get in my car and go drive, you know, 15 kilometers or whatever to go buy my tool. Uh, we need to stop doing that as individuals when you say, well, do I really need that tool today? Or can I combine that trip with two or three other things that I need, my partner needs, my children need and do it tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Now, this is not going to change the world, but this is how we, we begin to create new habits um, as individuals and as societies, we simply, you know, cannot continue to, to spend uh, and, and I'm not taking a political position here at all, but I mean, for instance, the, the kinds of the crazy kind of fiscal spending that we're engaged in today, you know, around, say, Ukraine or Israel and Hamas, and we could name a dozen other hot spots in the world. We simply can't afford to be doing that anymore. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that those things are going to stop. <laughs> They're not. But. At some point, you see, this is this is going to affect all of us. That that our governments are not going to be able to cut uh, the the services they provide to us in order to afford all of these fiscal expenses. So eventually, they're going to raise our taxes, and we're not going to like that. <laughs> that's going to change. That's going to and and so eventually, we'll start to change our behavior because it's costing too much. To maintain our behavior that's that's where i think we're and and if technology can help well that's great but my sense is that is that our our adjustment is far more fundamental than technology can fix in general it may it may it may be great for one guy with solar panels and, and a hydrogen tank but it's not a solution that's going to work for you know for society in general I totally agree with the overall, uh, as, you know, uh, view that uh, you know we have to think about uh, you know using much less energy, and it goes much more fundamental than te technology solutions for for all. I I think we need, of course, is a technology uh, as well, but it goes much deeper, and it's it's basically a, a, a economic and political change as well, obviously, uh, because we have built an economy on based on uh, growth on a finite planet <laughs> so and, and that's very important to remember but uh, we have talked a lot already so thank you so much uh, Arthur and uh, in the next episode we'll continue this talk but we'll focus on the shale oil production and uh, how this is the impact of a decline in in that sector will have on our overall economy and so, but thanks again and I want to thank you Johan for uh you know, for reaching out to me and, and uh, getting, you know, getting the two of us involved in this conversation, because I think it is, it's something that people need to be aware of and think about. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for watching The Evolution Show. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. 
If you want to support the show, feel free to give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. It really means a lot. And stick around for part two of my conversation with Art Berman, which will be available on The Evolution Show next week. This time we look specifically at why the world production of oil may start to decline over the next couple of years. You definitely don't want to miss that. Finally, feel free to share what you think in the comments below. And stay ahead of the curve. <laughs>